Today we are talking about technology and war. And in a sense the importance of technology in war is both obvious and to some degree opaque. It's obvious because we become very used to thinking about the importance of uh, certain key weapons or technical systems that we see in war um, one of the domains in which technological breakthroughs are pursued with great intensity and their consequences on the battlefield are readily observable. And yet it's also opaque because we often have quite a narrow understanding of what counts as military technology or what kind of technology we tend to uh, focus on. And so in this uh, session we'll think about some very big claims that are made about technology and war, including the, including the notion of a revolution in military affairs, and we'll also take the opportunity to think quite thoroughly about what we mean by technology and how some of the more popular accounts of technology in the military context or in a wider social context are often limiting, are flawed, um, and in need of uh, more thorough and systematic thinking. I invite you in at this moment uh, to pause the video briefly and go and visit the uh, following website here. Um, there's a, there'll be a link next to the video. This is a uh, website from the US Ministry of Defense, that is the Pentagon, and it lists on a daily basis the new contracts that have been agreed by the Pentagon. And so uh, go and have a look, just peruse these listings, scroll past them and, and um, witness the uh, amount of contracts that are issued on a daily basis by the Pentagon, the eye-watering sums that are dedicated to many of these contracts, and the diversity of technical uh, systems that are being purchased, serviced, um, and so forth um, through these contracts. And that gives us a very small but nonetheless insightful um, look into the scale, the sheer scale of investment and expenditure on uh, technology in the context of the modern military war machine. So go and have a look. So we should talk about now uh, an idea that has circulated uh, a great deal within military circles in one shape or another since uh, the early 1980s. And that is the notion of a revolution in military affairs. In its simplest terms, the idea began to emerge around the late 70s, early uh, 80s. First, in fact, within Soviet military circles, then much more uh, consistently and enthusiastically within uh, US defense uh, communities, that a radical change or transformation in the conduct of war was uh, about to take place or was in already had already begun and this idea then that became the notion of a revolution in military affairs was largely centered around the development of information and communication uh, technologies but the idea that um, through modern sensors through modern telecommunication systems um, and through high precision weapon systems, the coming war machine would be one that would attain a far greater degree of vision, knowledge, uh, perception of uh, the battle space and alongside with it an ability to coordinate strength to a far greater extents across greater expanses at faster tempos and ultimately to target enemy forces to decisively uh, defeat enemies much faster 
and with a much higher degree of precision. And so, as I say, this is an idea that uh, has gone through several uh, incarnations and still persists uh, to this day uh, to a large degree. Some of the most kind of bombastic language that we can find surrounding these ideas uh, is of uh, the kind that is expressed by Admiral William Owens in his 2000 book, uh, Lifting the Fog of War, an obvious reference to Clausewitz's idea of a fog of war. Never in history, Admiral Owens tells us, has a military commander been granted an omniscient view of the battlefield, that is to say a complete, absolute, all-knowing view of the battlefield. In real time, by day or night, and in all weather conditions, as much of the battlefield and an enemy force to allow vital maneuver and devastating firepower to deliver the coup de grace in a single blow. Today's technology promises to make that possible. So that's quite typical of some of the language, rhetoric, discourse that has surrounded the notion of a revolution in military affairs. The idea that just around the corner is a radical new uh, way to wage war uh, in an uh, incredibly decisive fashion. That whoever will seize this technological opportunity will gain uh, incredible dominance. And that the consequently the traditional constraints on war, such as class fishing ideas as friction and the fog of war, which were thought to be inherent to the conduct of war, now appeared potentially redundant. And yet, the idea of a military revolution driven by information technology and the, and the notion that this would ensue, what would ensue from this is some form of omniscience and even omnipotence on the battlefield is not a new idea. Indeed, precedes what became known as the revolution in military affairs. All the way back in 1969, General William Westmoreland, who was the commander-in-chief uh, for US forces in Vietnam, uh, gave an address in which he explained that on the battlefield of the future, enemy forces will be located, tracked and targeted almost instantaneously through the use of data links, computer-assisted intelligent evaluation and automated fire control. I see battlefields that are under 24-hour real or near real-time surveillance of all types. I see battlefields on which we can destroy anything we can locate through instant communications and almost instantaneous application of highly lethal firepower. With cooperative effort, no more than 10 years should separate us from the automated battlefield. So we can see that there's really been recurrent ideas. This is, you know, this is a speech given more than 50 years ago. Recurrent ideas in uh, the last half century that computing technology is on the brink of ushering a radical change in the conduct of war. And of course, uh, there's no doubt that computers have uh, altered very significantly the conduct of war. And we could certainly recognize in contemporary expressions of warfare uh, many of the traits described by Westmoreland. The increasing use of uh, computer systems at all levels, uh, rapid telecommunication exchange, uh, much higher degrees of precision, a greater vulnerability of uh, entities on the battle space that can be seen remotely and targeted also remotely. On the other hand, we see also uh, consistently in those kinds of uh, predictions um, claims about the imminence of the change that, will about, that, that is about to arrive that uh, tends to be frustrated. Those predictions do not turn out this way. But moreover, the kind of dominance and omnipotence that is claimed to follow from this technology has been even less liable to materialize. After all, the United States has, in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, found it extremely difficult to achieve 
uh, its foreign policy goals through the use of military force, despite its clear dominance uh, in, a military, in terms of military technology, its clear leadership in the transformation of military systems in accordance with this informational model. So we have to uh, approach these claims, therefore, uh, with some degree of skepticism. For Paul Virilio, what we see really at the heart of the RMA and its and such similar claims is a will to see all, to know all, at every instant, everywhere the will to universalize illumination, a scientific version of the eye of God which would forever rule out the surprise, the accident, the eruption of the unforeseen. And so we can indeed recognize a drive within this um, idea of a revolution in military affairs for some um, resolution of the problems that have always plagued military forces. Uh, the chaos that um, interrupts or derails the plans of the commander, the chance events that Clausewitz believed were such an inherent aspect of war, there is a desire to banish these, um, which comes from a very profound impulse to uh, some form of uh, divine uh, mastery. Now, if we take this idea of the military revolution uh, and look at it a little bit more closely, what we can see is that uh, it is in fact an idea that was developed originally by um, within military history, in particular by the figure of Michael Roberts, who, and we've discussed this briefly already uh, when we talked about the rise of the modern state, who expressed the idea in the 1950s that if we looked at early modern history in, Euro in the European context, we could identify a military revolution. The idea that the introduction of portable firearms led to new tactics and military training, uh, methods that were pioneered by the Swedes and the Dutch between 1560 and 1660. And a clear line is then drawn by Roberts and others between these innovations and the larger professional armies that emerged. And one could push the argument further and show that, or claim at least, that it is the need to supply and to uh, constitute these larger armies that drove the emergence of modern states. So one fairly uh, crude argument could be, well, in fact, it's the introduction of firearms which led to transformations in warfare, which led to the emergence of the modern state. And these kinds of arguments are really pretty common. Uh, we find many examples of claims that will locate in the advent of a new technology, the origins of a large scale transformation of warfare and perhaps of wider society. So whether it is the longbow, the artillery or introduction of artillery, the musket, the telegraph, the railway, the machine gun, the radio, the combustion engine, the aeroplane, or the nuclear bomb, one can construct accounts, certainly, that would show or would assert that the arrival of these technologies had radical effects on the way in which war was fought. And that if we follow those radical effects, we can then also uh, explain wider social transformations, geopolitical shifts, uh, cultural developments, and so forth. And you can spin a good story, undoubtedly, on that basis. Accounts about you know, the weapon that changed the world. 
But while such accounts may appear at first glance highly plausible and even quite seductive, at closer inspection, they can be generally found to rest on simplistic understandings of technology that do not really probe the nature of technology or of technological change. And this is what we will now endeavor to do in some depth.